Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to a session on the role of faith in developing trust and how that plays out. Wonderful panel with us today. Uh, people from business, uh, faith community. employee resource groups uh, centered around faith. They have six different groups for Christians, Muslims, uh, Jewish people. They also have one for uh, atheists or agnostics. Recently, the, they, we had a panel discussion with the Muslim, head of the Muslim group, Jewish group, and Christian group. You know, it sounds like a joke, but they, they came together and uh, they were sharing just how warm they, uh, can, warmly they can work together in the company because they can bring uh, as uh, Hadi Sharifi, the head of the Muslim group, said, their whole souls to work, not just their whole self to work. And uh, and then we ask a question, well, how does that uh, that sort of openness to faith in the workplace as part of the diversity? You know, there's diversity of all kinds, sexual orientation, gender, race, uh, including religion. And they said, how does that affect your attitude toward work and, and, and trust in the company. And Patty said, you know, our CEO just changed. And, you know, we, we had his going away message. And you know, Hadi's a PhD in, in engineering, you know, engineering the company. And he said, as I watched that him give his talk, I just broke down and cried. I, I was just weeping uh, because the CEO is leaving. And he said, why would I do that? He said, well, it's because I can bring my whole soul to work. And this is a place where I feel family. You know, my Christian and my Muslim and, and my Baha'i friend back in Iran, Baha'is are uh, outcasts. But here in the company, that's open and we're, we're friends. And so that openness to faith um, made a more trusting and, and committed environment in the company. So there's many stories like that. Well, today we're going to touch on a lot of different to topics related to trust and, and corporate trust companies. Our first guest is Yasek Oltek, the uh, Chief Operating Officer of Philip Morris International. And their company, uh, being a cigarette company, has had to go through some massive transformation and trying to build trust uh, with, with customers and society in general. So Yasek, what's that journey been like and you know just tell us about what you're going through as a company so as i guess most of the audience uh, they know philip morris international as the cigarette uh, company the, the international leader the owner of the you know such a great trademarks as their brands like marlboro and you can only imagine uh, what the reactions we have been uh, confronted with about the six, seven years ago when we said we want to stop selling cigarettes or we want to unsmoke the world or we want to go smoke free. And the, the reaction was, as we anticipated, they said, we don't believe you. We don't believe you because it is not believable that you can do it. We don't believe you because we don't think you have real intention to do so, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? So it is obviously the legacy, the the, the perceptions earned, not 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 earned. And we realize if we want to make it real and happen, we obviously need the license to operate. Every business needs the license to operate. But this is unwritten license to operate. And obviously, you need to have a trust of your employees, you need to have a trust of your shareholders, your stakeholders, your board, your suppliers, uh, consumers, but obviously you need to also have a trust of your regulators, right? Because they can facilitate, accelerate and not accelerate uh, the, the, the rollout of innovation. So we've been very cognizant about this whole thing and we had a long discussions at the close senior management at the time here and we said okay we can't do much to change the past so whatever perceptions we have heard the opinions about the philip morris international as very often you hear big tobacco uh, carried uh, with us from the past we can't change it right whatever we say however we'll start to explain what was the past was the past but we do have a lot of impact on how we can be perceived or how it can be uh, received going forward. 
So we embark on this process, which we didn't call it a trust uh, gaining process. It was more in the context of a credibility, right? That, you know, how we can put position Philip Morris on this transformation, start smoke the word of the credible, trustworthy, etc. And uh, we realized that, first of all, there's a two-way process, right, in, in our opinion, <clears throat> learning so far. One which is built on a transparency. So this is me to the outside world. It is me to all of these communities, which I mentioned, employees, consumers, regulators. And second thing, I cannot <clears throat> impose the transparency on the other side, but I can apply empathy in the way I am approaching the other side. So can I really listen? Can I really open my mind? Maybe some of the, maybe the moments when others don't trust us and don't believe us are actually well grounded and I have to take it into consideration. I have to go redo my strategy, redo my thinking, etc. So I think the key words, as I said, is transparency and empathy, which somehow paves you the way for the two ways dialogue. Uh, so it's a very rewarding journey. A quarter of our business already today is in its three products. So I think we now demonstrated that these are not only our words and the, and the mission, vision, and objective targets, but we really walk the talk. And I believe you, you're in the process of a continuously building or rebuilding the trust. And I compare it to like the a bottle full of a liquid. You continuously have to refill that bottle you know every day every moment what you say what you do you continue refilling that bottle you cannot have uh you cannot have access of trust but you can very quickly have a deficit create a deficit of trust even if you don't drink it if you don't spoil it it will naturally evaporate and people are thinking that trust is a something very tangible that i earned that I don't think you can ever earn the trust. You're continuously earning the trust. Is that the credits which you have to refill to that bottle every day, every moment, every week, every action, every way the company, you know, demonstrates itself or show itself to the, to the outside world. Couple of years ago, I don't exactly remember when I had the lunch with, uh, with David. In, in Manhattan. I still vividly remember the table and the restaurant. I will not disclose what we have been, what we have been eating on that lunch, <laughs> but I do remember every detail. And I was introduced to David or David to me that, you know, David has the, this is his background in the, <clears throat> in this domain. And we start having this conversation. And, and I, always in a business, when you're confronted with a challenge with the problem, your natural desire first is to check whether that problem has been already uh, solved by someone else, right? Can I borrow the solution? So our conversations went into the directions that are there any examples of regaining the trust, rebuilding the trust? And I didn't know that we will end up so deeply, which, you know, thanks to David, that we, well, thanks to David recommendations, we said, why don't we start looking into main religions and I see whether there is any answer to that questions, how that process looks like, how you can make shortcut of it, right? I mean, uh, maybe they are the trick in a positive you know, sense of this word, which you can apply so I can, you know, I can be a better in my business. And hence, David produced this wonderful paper, which I believe he's going to talk in a, in a second. And I don't know how many times I read that paper and how, how many times my conversations have started because we had that paper. On a simple subject is what is the process of trust? How trust is important to us, we know. But what is exactly that process and what is the best path to, to, to build the trust and the nurture that passed. And I believe this nurturing of the, of the trust is a very important component. It's easier to climb, presumably, but to maintain it at that level. So I'm very much you know, looking forward to this conversation. And thank you for giving me opportunity to, to participate in this very diverse panel. I'm already excited. Uh, I'm already very much excited about it. Well, thank you, Jacek. Yeah, I mean... Uh, it's good to know some of the backstory of your meeting with David. And, and uh, so the, uh, Dr. David Miller will speak next. And he's worked with uh, Philip Morris International to uh, 
do some thinking about how the major faith traditions <clears throat> have something to say about how to build trust, gain trust. And uh, David, I, I, I showed those your sort of 11 points to my wife yesterday, and she said, and she's pretty religiously conversant, and she says, I've never seen anything like this of applying these principles to to business, to, you know, to real life situations. It's great. So tell us about it. Well, f first, you know, I, I think many traditions and we know that the phrase confession is good for the soul. So, so uh, I will confess, I was an investment banker and senior executive in the corporate world before studying theology and going into the crazy world of academia that I now live and, and love, I might add. But my passion is integrating these two domains of knowledge, these two domains of life, the, the theological domain, looking at it through multiple traditions and the corporate world where people make and build and create things that help society or can hurt society. So that's uh, uh, why perhaps I, I look always to take these ideas and transpose them into the, the key of life. But yeah, Yatsik, I remember that lunch just as vividly. And you said, well, do you have any ideas? And and of course, we were just getting to know each other. And I said, well, you know, this may sound crazy. I'm not sure where you are in this topic, but but uh, but maybe we ought to look at religious traditions, traditions plural, to think about how they think about trust and how perhaps we could transpose some of those ideas into the corporate world. And Yatsik happily did not fall over or, or throw his meal at me or anything. And he said, we'll say more. And I said, well, look, if, you know, if we take the great religious traditions at their very best, there's one thing they're all really good at. He said, what's that? And I said, they're good at, at bringing a pathway back to wholeness with your community. If you, if you kind of use old fa fashioned language, if you've sinned against your neighbor, if you've harmed your neighbor or in a business, a counterparty, a client, a regulator, you, if, if you've injured or harmed someone, religions always have. They can bring you back into the community. There's through a series of rituals or activities or processes, you can become a whole again. You can come back into the community. And I said, maybe I'm all wet, but I'll bet there's some ideas in the great religious traditions that carefully understood and transposed might be helpful to businesses. And he said, well, let's take a, let's take a shot at it. So with a colleague, Michael Tayton and I from, from Princeton, we did this independent of Princeton University, but we t embarked on this project to ask that question, what can we learn? And, and we, 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 for scope and scale reasons, we looked at the three Abrahamic traditions, asking what does Judaism, Christianity, and Islam have to say about this? Of course, we could have included Hinduism, many other, uh, 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 Jainism and so forth, many other traditions, but for Time management reasons, we focused on those three, which cover well over the world's uh, half the world's uh, population. And we found amazing commonalities amongst these traditions. We interviewed about 30 different scholars from all different religious traditions, about an equal balance of male, female, people of color, every single continent. And we found resonances on 11 different ideas, 11 different things that were common amongst all three of those traditions. And I would uh, submit probably other traditions as well, even though I haven't yet done the formal research on it. And we, we called them uh, seven, uh, these 11 theses or ideas uh, that, that aren't, I mean, it'd be overly simplistic to say it's like 11 steps to rebuilding trust. I mean, that's silly. It, 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 but there, but there's, there's ideas in this that maybe one or two ideas could unlock the road towards rebuilding for a particular company or organization particularly one that has, like PMI is doing, recovering from an absence of trust. And it's one of the things that we learn about in, the, in one of the, in fact, one of the theses, I, I think it was uh, uh, number 11, uh, is what I call the vector of time. Uh, religious uh, ideas, religions think about time very differently. They don't think quarterly returns, uh, shareholder returns, year-end returns, earning per share. They think about time uh often certainly have a long-term horizon and based on your tradition, maybe even something called infinity or heaven or eternity is involved in their traditions. So can a company actually expand their horizon? And, and that's one of the great lessons from, from religious traditions. Uh, I mean, another one, for example, is uh, in the corporate world, everything is so contractual, isn't it? We, we have a contract for this. We've got an army of lawyers. Uh, and often that's how disputes are are, are, are resolved and invariably they're unsatisfactory to almost every party involved. Uh, but religions tend not to focus on contract, they tend to focus on covenant. This idea of a covenant, it's a covenantal mindset. It's, if you will, more relational than transactional. 
well, how can a company, of course, we're always going to need lawyers. I understand that. I'm not naive. But how can we shift the mindset of an organization towards a covenantal mindset as opposed to, as opposed to a, a legalistic or contractual one? And maybe one other idea of these to just to sort of give a, a sense of a flavor of some of these. And, and by the way, let me stress that the, that the paper, this white paper, is, uh, uh, we say, towards uh, a restoration of trust. So it's a journey. Uh, it's not something that, oh, we do these things, it's all there. It's a multi-year journey and maybe even a multi-generational journey. Uh, and and the, the second thing is it's not about religiosity. So you could be an atheist, read this white paper and go, wow, there's some intelligent ideas there. Let me draw on them. Now, if you happen also to be a person of faith, you'll know you're not alone because these 11 theses are consistent across at least these three traditions, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, so the, the, the other, one of the things that struck me, I think it's thesis um, number nine, uh, asks the question, what is, what is a, a corporation's real God or God's plural? Well, let's say small g, for example. Most, most organizations have marvelous aspirational statements or phrases, but frankly, if you ask many people, even employees, they'll often say they ring hollow. It's just very, very clever marketing. It's very clever uh, sort of spin doctoring with all due respect to people in public relations. Uh, but, but what is it really? Is it aspirational? And if so, what are you doing to get there? Or is it real and is it, is it a lived real experience? So it's an interesting question to ask. What what is what are, what are our gods? What are the things that we revere most? What is number one for us? Many traditions will have a phrase similar or with a basic uh, sense sense that you'll see it in the the Ten Commandments of Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. And I don't mean God in like a theistic sense, but God could be money, it could be shareholder return, it could be power, it could be any number of things. These things which we have as our gods. Uh, it's a healthy conversation. Uh, maybe one last one, Brian, just to throw in that is very much in the wheelhouse of uh, great religious traditions. And that's uh, the idea of ritual. I know when I was younger and if I would go to a house of worship, rituals, frankly, they bored me like, ah, thank you, you know, let's get over this. Let's, let's get to something interesting. But rituals teach us things. They remind us things. There's an institutional memory. Uh, one one uh, large international company I work with who's not always had a beautiful history. They've had a checkered ethical history, uh, not worth going into here. And they've gone on this journey of rebuilding trust, too. By the way, I don't think you can ever restore trust, but you can rebuild it. That was one of our findings. I mean, if you broke something, you broke it. And, and by the way, another one of our theses says, not everyone is, you're never going to convince everyone. You will always say, I am so angry at you, Company X, because you did this, and my mother died because of you, and I will never forget you, whatever you do. Well, one of our theses says, we, A, we need to acknowledge that and respect that. As you were saying, Yatsek, listen, even when it's really painful, and, and sometimes you may want to go, but, but, but we're doing this now. They're not going to want to hear it. It's just the ship has sailed, and, and you have to, uh, the pain then has to, you just have to absorb and walk alongside their pain and respect it. Um, but, but, but what we learn is these rituals in this one company that when you go into their headquarters right now, they, they've sort of constructed a, uh, a, like a labyrinth where you walk through different decades of the company's existence. The company is about 80 years old. And, and it has photographs of very embarrassing things they've done. It has little narratives. It's like going through a museum. And they're owning their history so that those that come after, and again, it's a great religious thing. Let's not forget why. You know, think of uh, you know Moses uh, coming out of out of uh, uh, Egypt and being reminded, reminding the people, and it helps. I think the the younger generation, the people that are all going to be wearing our uh, hats uh, in in a very short time, the next generation of leaders, they want this honesty, they want this authenticity, and frankly, many of them. Uh, realize no company is pure or perfect. Uh, the church is not pure or perfect, I might add. I mean, frankly, it's, it's, I find it very exciting. And, and PMI let this be a public document, uh, although they commissioned it. Uh, obviously, full disclosure on that. Uh, it was full independence. It's my ideas. They didn't, and my colleague Michaels and our scholars we talked to, it's, this is not meant as a PR piece. But the fascinating thing is how many uh, other companies have, have, are circulating it now amongst their C-suite and just uh, informally and informally to say, how do we think about this? Uh, in fact, Yatsik, as you know, we, we talked about it at uh, Davos a year ago, January, when we were in person. 
I was stunned at the number of the people who came up and said, well, like, wow, you're kidding. Tell me more as opposed to, that's kind of crazy. <laughs> so well, let me stop there. But it's been a rich journey, which I, I'm still learning from, and it's been a, a delight to contribute to the conversation. Oh, thank you, David. We, I mean, it would be great to just have you read the paper. Right? So I encourage everybody to look it up. It, it, we have a version of it or a link to it on our website at the Religious Freedom Business Foundation, or if you just Google David Miller and uh, the 11 Theses, I think you'll you'll be able to navigate to it. So contact us if you want to get a copy. Well, I, I want to move to Canon Sarah Snyder. So Sarah has been a participant in in uh, the Harassus uh, meeting for a number of times. We've been part of panels together. Um, Sarah, I, I, you're you're the Archbishop of Canterbury's uh, representative on reconciliation. Um, feel free to react to what we've heard already. I mean, it's sort of a new thing to hear businesses engaged in reconciliation. But you know, go ahead and take our discussion to the next step, Sarah. Thank you, Brian. Can you hear me? Because I have to say I couldn't hear David, um, and I'm devastated because that was such a great lead-up. So I could see the chat, um, but I'm afraid I can't connect with what you said right now, David, uh, and apologize for that. Um, I did see in the chat somebody mentioning Kensuki um, and the Japanese practice of, uh, yes. of uh, healing, if you like, mending broken vessels. Sorry. And I just want to say that our... Um, uh, the work that I do, we think of reconciliation and peace building um, in that kind of metaphor, healing what is broken, whether it's broken relationships, whether it's broken communities, um, whether it's even broken institutions or, or, or people. Um, that's our view of reconciliation. And I thought I might just start um, by a story from South Sudan. So go to a completely different part of the world, um, to the world that many of us are from right now. And I've had the privilege of working there a lot uh, up until the pandemic began. Uh, and South Sudan is a country where two thirds of the population are Christian, a small minority are Muslim, and the remainder follow African traditional religions. They've got around 60 ethnic groups, often aligned with the same religion. Oh, no, it looks like we've lost Sarah. Uh, yeah, so uh, we'll give her just a second to pop back on. Um, but if she doesn't pop back on in the next, we'll, we'll jump to Ahmed um, uh, Al-Haddad, uh, who's the CEO of uh, Swish Air. And um, maybe you can pick up the conversation. If Sarah comes back, we'll let her come back in, and then you can uh, continue the discussion. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brian. <clears throat> I'm the CEO of uh, Swiss Air and uh, also the owner of uh, iUmra.12, which is the world's uh, first pilgrimage as a service uh, platform. Uh, having uh, been in business uh, and in capitalism for quite some time, uh, I realized that 80% of the world believes in faith. And according to Maslow, uh, the fifth level is uh, uh, transcendence. Uh, that means uh, believing in a higher spiritual uh, being. Uh, in the age of uh, digital disruptions, uh, Uber and ev all the other four levels had already been disrupted. And that means uh, the needs of uh, uh, the global citizens have been met. Uh, however, when it came to the fifth level, which is uh, transcendence, uh, there was an empty space there. So wanted to see what can business do uh, in rebuilding and deploying uh, faith. What can we offer faith from the technical uh, people, from the business community and the technical community? Uh, what, what is it that we can do for them? In that, I, I'll give you a story. Uh, in around 2014, 2015, as a Muslim and a part of the Abrahamic faith, I traveled, uh, my dad wanted to travel to Mecca. He was very old, uh, he passed away, but he was above uh, around 70, 75 years old. Uh, to perform that journey the way uh, Abraham performed it, uh, it was very tiresome for him, as you can imagine. So coming from a digital background, I sat and thought, what is it that we can do uh, uh, to provide uh, people who are not able or who cannot do, uh, perform or fulfill uh, their fifth level needs so I decided this, this can be an application as well. This would be what we are giving back uh, to the community. 
what we need is to bring people of faith uh, uh, and business together. And faith itself, as pilgrimage itself, it, it is a business. Uh, it is a business, or it's, it's a process. It's a process of fulfillment. Once, uh, uh, once a year, or once in your lifetime, you'd want to visit Mecca and see and learn and 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 gain, be part of something, uh, uh, being part of something spiritual. In doing so, uh, we looked at uh, sustainability and urban resilience. Uh, for the holy sites. Uh, most of these holy sites are, are 2,000 or 5,000 years old. Uh, to do that, we had to look at the carbon footprint as well. Uh, and it, we are in the digital age. The, the younger generation that are coming after us are all uh, up-oriented. Everything has to be an application. If it's not on the smartphone, it's not there. So how do we connect? How do we connect the spiritual cloud with the virtual cloud? This is it. And that is, uh, that is the key in deploying faith and de- developing trust. Yes, we are, we are a different generation. Our generation was very good. I think uh, we succeeded in emails. We succeeded in this. But the generation that is, uh, the, the new generation, Generation X, that is Snapchat, Tinder, Facebook, LinkedIn, is, is totally different. And if it is not on on the Apple Store or on an Android Store, we ca- they will not be able to be engaged. And we similar to other disruptor. They, they, uh, some people would refer them as uh, disruptors. I call them facilitators because they did a very good job. Uh, most of these applications made our life easier, including uh, 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 the website that we are chatting on. We have this ability to uh, outsource the pilgrimage, right? So for the old people and people who want to travel to Mecca even uh, this time and are not able to fulfill that need, especially uh, this time uh, of, of COVID, uh, we need to have that reassurance. We need to know that we are still all connected. We are, every, everyone is okay. Uh, they can use the application and outsource the pilgrimage uh, through an app, and, the, and they'll be able to see someone perform that pilgrimage in Mecca, live-streamed, yeah, and gain that satisfaction, okay, at a much lesser cost, and and uh, by reducing uh, or offsetting three thousand uh, k- kilograms of carbon. So, and that's not that's not all what we are doing. We are also planting fifty one trees for every pilgrimage that is performed. So we are offsetting that that uh, uh, that travel. Uh, the carbon that is generated by uh, by traveling, and these are some of the things that we thought that the generation, the younger generation, would want. And and the younger generation are more environmental uh, connected. They are they are very uh, so. If uh, if any if there, there is any, uh, uh, they would always look at the environmental. They would look at whether you are recycling. They would look at a lot of things. We need to match their expectations, and in matching their expectations, uh, we will be able to develop the trust. Uh, that's uh, basically it. But from a macro perspective, from a macro perspective, is uh, ensuring that uh, uh, the urban resilience and sustainability in the holy sites uh, in Mecca in uh, in in Jerusalem, in India, in, in all of the other countries that have uh, uh, national heritage sites. Um, and these sites you could also earn from uh, digital tourism, or spiritual or faith-based uh, tourism. In this, yes, uh, we, would, uh, we, we looked at uh, creating or developing what we would call a faith-based entrepreneurs, yes. They are entrepreneurs. We know there are a lot of entrepreneurs. There are some who want to go to Mars. Uh, others, uh, we, we support everybody. 
But uh, what about the 80% faith-based uh, population? Uh, nice. what, what is their uh, income source? Where will they earn a living from? Uh, Sarah will told you that uh, she was in Sudan, uh, South Sudan. Everybody has the right to earn a living. But uh, in only fulfilling the five levels of Maslow, uh, all the levels together, is when we can actually uh, uh, attain that uh, satisfaction and happiness within ourselves, knowing that we did a good job. Yeah, well, thank you. That And just to imagine that technology is uh, part of that trust building when technology can also be something that's dangerous as well. So thanks. But uh, you mentioned Sarah, and we lost Sarah. We lost you for a while. So let's jump back. Sarah, you mentioned uh, South Sudan, and that's when we lost your feed. If you could pick your story back up there. Yeah, I'll try and remember. Did you lose me quickly? Uh, right when you were just starting to talk about South Sudan yeah. and then you were on. So. Yeah, so I was really um, just, first of all, throwing a spotlight on, on countries that are, uh, are predominantly, if not entirely, um, compiled of religiously practicing people and what that looks like and, and, and what it means for that kind of interaction between the private and the public uh, space and our private and our public encounters and how our religious worldview um, can uh, feed into our decision making, our motivations, our buying power, all those things that, that we know about, um, not just in our private life, but also in, our, in the public space. And the story I told was when I, I had the privilege of meeting our new um, head of DFID, a new minister who had taken on this role, and he came to South Sudan for the first time. And he asked me uh, how I thought we might get the messaging of the peace process out to the communities, particularly those communities where um, the UN and the World Health Organization can't reach for either safety or, or other reasons. And uh, I said, well, you could start by uh, communicating through the religious hierarchy. You know, we have these inbuilt systems that enable you to speak to the archbishops and the moderators and then they can speak to their bishops and they can speak to their clergy and they can speak to their congregations and they can speak to their communities. And the, the guy was flabbergasted. He had no idea that South Sudan would have such a network. And I, you know, obviously I wondered who briefed him, but I also um, suggested that maybe a simple way to start would be a, a, a church resource, given that two thirds of the country are Christian. That might reach for a start a lot of um, the communities, which is what they did, but new territory for him uh, and probably new territory for Diffin. So I think the point that I'm trying to make, I also told the story, which many of you might know, because it's well documented, of the Ebola crisis in Liberia, where uh, the, um, the the cultural practice of kissing the dead goodbye meant that the disease was spreading very quickly. And the World Health Organization tried very hard to stop that. Um, but it wasn't until the Christian and Muslim leaders got into the pulpits and reminded the people, this is a cultural practice. This is not religiously required and it does not have any impact on whether your loved ones, where your loved ones go after death. Um, and then there was this astonishing shift in, in behavior as a result. So, so I suppose the take home message really for us is that we need to collaborate with our religious leaders if we want to effect change, if we want to build trust, um, and if we want to have a sustainable shift in the way in which we're working in our communities. Uh, and I know many of you on the platform here are doing that already. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. And I, I want to just go back to Ahmed, a statistic, Ahmed, you were citing of 80% of the world's population uh, are affiliated with the faith. It's actually 85% up to 90. And, and that's part of the work I've done in my academic background. But like David, I'm one of these crossover kind of people. Um, but I want to come to Yasek and, and just just uh, come back to this idea of the um, uh, sort of the public morality, the uh, this philosophy of how to um, build trust, you know, and, and what David provided that drew on some religious uh, concepts. It, and David mentioned that there's some other companies looking at this. Do you, I mean, you're a leader of a, a, a large top company in the world. Do you think other leaders would, be willing to engage in this discussion? And if so, 
you know, is there a platform for that or is it just something that happens um, yeah, by chance? No, the platform, at least to my knowledge, uh, <clears throat> doesn't exist. I think it's also a something which I believe as a business leader, you rather don't want to talk publicly that you might have a deficit of trust, right? It's something which you would like to avoid. And that's a fortunate, unfortunate, I think rather unfortunate type of story. The reality is that I don't want to sound too philosophical. I think all of us have a deficit of trust, right? There is a trust to the political elite. There is a trust uh, to the science because you have a bad science. There is a look what is happening these days as we speak about the uh, vaccines, right? The, the, the whole conversations which is happening this moment about the AstraZeneca vaccine. Is it okay? Is it not okay? Are they side effects? They are not side effects. This all creates a lot of confusion, right? And which is nothing else than the erosion of the trust. Should I trust WHO? Yes, we should. But is WHO doing the right things? Is it communicating in the right way that are continuously, as I said before, maintaining a trust level? You, you cannot own the trust. I mean, a people think is a is like a car, right? Or is like an asset. I bought it, I put it into the safe and I have a trust. No, you don't. It, it is like a vapor. It, it continuously escapes and you have to, you know, continue investing. EU, the European Union Commission about how do they handle the crisis. Look how much misinformation we all receive to wear the mask, not to wear the mask. I'm deliberately referring to the crisis, which is still not over. This is a real time event. And look how much erosion of a trust we generated to all stakeholders, which were important. Actually, I like what Sarah uh, the, the, the referred to, because from my business perspective, you're actually talking to the religious organizations as a channel of communication, right? And as long as the channel has the degree of trust, then you should actually go and proactively use the channel because it solves your other problems. So it's not the channel which is only defined by the content, which is, I guess, you know, religious messaging and practices and so on, which is absolutely perfect. But if the channel in the such a deficit of a trustworthy channels, if you identified in a case of a South Sudan that that's the channel which people trust, just go after that. Because you don't have a choices, you don't have a, you know, twelve other channels which I can, which do exist. And secondly, do people trust the channel? And I think it's getting worse and worse. And uh, so I think that maybe, maybe one day, in Davos or in other places, there will be more of a open conversations about what do we do collaterally as the, as the. <clears throat> you know, with regards to the trust and how to rebuild it. But but again, I'm sorry for repetition. I think people have to understand one thing. You can't have it. You continuously have to earn it. And that's the whole thing. And, and an unfortunate thing, which I have learned from David, David confirmed what I was, you know, uh, suspicious about is that this is this process will never end. You, you you cannot say that this is my three year plan or seven year plan and you know by the year seven the corporate the corporations will deliver, we regain the trust. Unfortunately it doesn't exist. So you like it or you don't like it, but this is this is what it is. And you have to prepare your organizations and yourself that you know your entire life or business life of the company is essentially about the continuously maintaining that credit, right? That the trust that what I call this unwritten license to operate to the consumer, to employees, to stakeholders, to to the places in which we operate and, you know, earn your trust every day, every morning. Okay, action by action. And I don't want to, as I said, don't want to sound too philosophical, but this is what it is. Okay, there is no other solution. I hope that David will give me a better solution, but this is what it is. Okay, let's, <laughs> let's enjoy what we have it and uh, and uh, and uh, get it. So, you know what is happening with social media, right? I mean, at these days, I mean, everything is the question this year. This is the technology. It's technology which has a positive aspect and a technology which might have a negative aspect. Everything can be abused. 
and we're very quick also in a today's world into jumping to opinions, right? Mm-hmm. Without this whole concept of a critical thinking is almost not existing, right? These opinions after opinion, seven times opinion repeated is being regarded as the as the fact. We don't know how to navigate. Maybe actually, again, thank you, Sarah, for bringing this up. Maybe referring to the channels, we still have a residual degree of uh, trust and a credibility. That's the best thing which we have. Well, I, I've, I've mentioned something, and Sarah is familiar with this, is uh, there's an organization called Religions for Peace. And Sarah, I think you're a trustee or you're, you're part of that. Um, yeah. And uh, the, the director of it, Aza Karam, has invited me to hold a discussion with their, their board leaders uh, sometime in the next month or so to talk about how they could better communicate with business. Um, and 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 build those uh, build those connections because uh, just like Sarah you mentioned it's not natural you know people uh, business leaders doesn't think oh religious communities they're my constituent or just like the Ministry of Foreign Affairs oh they're my con-, you know it's, it's the people it's sort of off the radar um, so uh, so Yasek and David maybe I'll, I'll throw it back to anyone but. Um, you know, what would be a natural platform to have this cross-fertilization that we're, we're sort of talking about? Frank, can I just say something a little bit off point in your question, but, but sure. I wanted to, uh, uh, Sarah, I think uh, you mentioned in one of the people in the chat, uh, Dr. Dabrowski mentioned uh, this kintsugi, the Japanese art of repairing broken pottery. So Mako Fujimura is, this happens to be his book on uh, the art and faith of theology of making, but it's also a theology of healing, which brings us a little bit into this trust conversation. Mako's a, a dear friend. We we live together in Princeton and get together all the time. So small world for how you convene this. But but there's things to learn, and, and there's a, a cultural and religious dimension to that. Um, uh, I, I, I think convening, uh, you know, I'm going to guess it will first take some small private sessions because a lot of CEOs are quite rightly don't want to be identified as a religious zealot. And yeah. heaven forbid, and a lot of people will will criticize them for that. Uh, uh, I, I have a model in some of my research. I suggest the company should be faith friendly, not faith based, but faith friendly, which embraces everybody, including atheists, agnostics, whatever you have faith in. Uh, but but I under, I respect why CEOs and C-suite executives are careful about what is quite rightly a very private part of our identity. But just like the whole diversity and inclusion movement. These private parts have public ramifications, and we need to find intelligent, thoughtful ways to articulate them about them. Um, one last thing, in case in case we're cut off, and that's um, uh, that there will be a, a reissuance of this uh, trust document towards the restoration of trust. Uh, the subtitle is uh, is is, is a preliminary insights and lessons from wisdom traditions. So I want to stress it's wisdom we're talking about. Wisdom, and I don't care where wisdom comes. If it comes from a science lab or Anybody, uh, an artist uh, or religion, we ought to look at it as leaders. And that's what we've, tr- we've tried to do here. And we have kind of a one year later version of this based on some of the global events which have gone on. Uh, and I think, uh, Yasek, that'll be released in the next month or so. And again, that'll be public domain. It'll be on our website, which I think someone has posted into the chat area. So thank you all. Yeah, so we're, we're just at the last minute of time. And I, I want to just comment on something, David, that you said is, is that these ideas um, have currency re- regardless of what your faith or belief is, that, you know, there's wisdom here. Um, at our annual conference we had on faith and belief in the Fortune 500 workplace, uh, and uh, Professor Andrew Abella, the dean of the Bush School of Business at Catholic University, talked about the virtues, you know, patience and prudence and uh, other, other topics like this. And, and he said, you know, you don't have to be religious to practice a virtue. And in fact, the more you practice it, the more it becomes you. Um, and so th- th- there are some of these universal ideas that, uh, that I think your paper nicely captured. Uh, so with that, uh, we're, we're going to have to close. I think I've just seen um, Mohammed <laughs> come in, but uh, we're, we're just closing. So Mohammed, uh, welcome. If you just want to say we have 15 seconds left, please say a, a greeting to everyone. 
<laughs> Greeting to everyone. I'm terribly sorry. I am one hour behind. I <laughs> I missed the, the time. I was thinking I'm 15 minutes early, but uh, pleased to see you all, Sarah, and everybody else as well. Terribly sorry about this, but uh, I am sure you had a wonderful time and look forward to see your uh, minutes or conclusion of it. Thank you. Well, our, our time our time has come come and now it's gone. So thank you, everyone. It's been a wonderful discussion. Thank you. you. That was bye a very short, short session. Bye-bye. Bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye.